down about um, six, the six thousand to seven thousand last year, yeah. and then quite a lot of drop by those works full. So this year we kind of switched it around. Unions only down about two thousand eight hundred people, and by the odds, uh, yeah. around six thousand. Okay. So what I was reading, so we're close to close to average, a little bit above um, average releases, but pretty close to it. Okay. When I was reading through that, I remembered that there was something that we discussed in previous meetings about about some kind of switch over. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks. Sure. And then um, on page nineteen here, so um, the Colorado Water Basin, its the storage level at March first was um, was eighty two percent. So the South Platte River Basin uh, Reservoir Storage at March 1st is 101%. So as you can see, if you go to the top there, you can see that's, so we basically have Boulder County, Laramie County, and Grand County there and Jackson County at the top. So if Grand, Boulder County, and Laramie were were dry and moderate drought. So it's uh, and we're we're kind of holding that. I looked at this was March 8th, but I just looked at March 17th and we're the same. So we're still we keep getting the weather patterns that we're currently in now where that's that's important this time of year because if you look at those weather patterns, it's you know rain rain snow here, snow in the mountains, then that snow pack starts to drop. So especially if you look at warm weather and dry, so we think we need to, I know we're supposed to dry this, warm and dry this weekend, but hopefully we'll, we'll start keeping those patterns. And I was going to touch base on that page. We get the first, uh, I I have it handy. I wrote it down, now let's see where it's at. Okay, so on the Colorado River Basin, we have 23 days till our peaks. The snowpack and then south by we have 35 days so we still need those weather patterns so basically all i have if there's any questions i'd be more than happy to answer any questions that was it this looks very similar to last year right yes actually so for the most part last year we're in better shape this year than last year except for this time last year around march 18th we had that fourth big highest snow in this region, the Front Range region, so that's what kind of, that was uh, March 18th, 19th, I believe, and that's what really changed last year's because we were we're kind of projected we were going higher, so we were really dry all the way up until towards the end of December, then we had all that snow um, the last part of December and January this year, and then in February we had like 63, four or five percent of precipitation, and so it started going down. Now March we were getting up above average precipitation, so we're pretty we're pretty close. Be nice to get big snow that's for sure yeah. Yeah, the real the real difference from last year isn't so much our basin it's the this colorado river basin was um extreme in an extreme drought red about half of the entire western world yeah there were the earlier snows this uh, mid-year the christmas snows yeah. really helped that colorado river basin well that's a good point because river Colorado River Basin is definitely better shaped right now than it because that snow is what I was talking about mainly impacted. It did a little bit in the it did in the mountains, but mainly on the Front Range or the Central Mountains, but it did impact the basin. <clears throat> Any other questions? Thanks, Ron. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, cash and lube. Tell me when. Yeah, um, I'll just that. report real quickly. Um, the action of course you, I think I sent out an email the council went ahead and approved a resolution on the change of the cash flow to 485 so that went um, pretty smoothly uh, we had a pretty good flush of cash flow come in <laughs> uh, in the 21 days before that council meeting we probably brought in as much cash flow as we did the two years prior <laughs> So, which it which was expected. Yeah. Um, uh, there's still a lot of uh, land out there, though, that's yet, yet to come in. Um, 
And so uh, we, we didn't, because that, that was just approved a, a, a little couple weeks ago, we, we don't have any additional information for, for the March cash and lead um, set up. Um, we have got a little bit of information on CBT. It has, uh, it was kind of sitting steady about 60 grand a unit, but it, we, we know of at least one entity trying to purchase, they just put out on the market, it says, I want 200, I want 200 shares of CBT, and they're offering 65,000 a share uh, or a unit. And um, so, I think they're going to say <laughs> they they bumped the market up five thousand um, dollars, but um, in terms of some of the local water rights, um, not a lot of change there. Um, so um, the one the one thing that I, I think I briefly mentioned this last month, um, council is in addition to looking at um, affordable housing. Um, they are also looking at kind of the next category of attainable housing. Um, and it, we may end up, so, so we'll co be probably coming back to water board to talk about how will attainable housing work in the water, um, that it, well, well water requirement policy. Um, it, it, it may, we may have a program similar to our affordable housing program. Actually, right now there is a task force that, um, I'm not on, so I can't tell you <laughs> what, kind of where the progress is, but there's a task force that's looking at attainable housing. Really kind of need to come up with a definition and how, how we do it. So, so it, you know, that kind of a process takes a little bit of time to get it right and bring it together. So we're not ready yet to, to start having the conversation about, it, you know, how that might look. Um, but I, you know, if, directs us, we could easily come up with a program similar to affordable housing. Um, and so just kind of a heads up that we'll probably be coming forward in sometime in the near future, you know, next quarter or so. Um, as soon as, and, and we'll keep you up to, as soon as we hear about the attainable housing kind of task force, kind of their work, we'll bring you up to speed on that and let you know. I don't know, Marcia, if you have anything more from council perspective? We kind of do and kind of don't. You know, there has not been um, discussion, and, and recently it seems like the discussion is among the housing staff, and then it comes to council bait. So, you know, I don't get a lot of previews. But what I can say is that, you know, of course, attainable housing has bigger margins than affordable housing. and more flexible financing requirements than affordable housing. So the incentives don't necessarily need to be as great as they do for affordable housing. But short of that, I have no idea. You know, the staff is uh, younger, so maybe possibly, um, you know, different ideas about what's going, you know, what's, what's gonna be appropriate, so on. I'm hoping that there'll be something innovative that comes before council, um, but I have not stuck my nose into it yet, so I don't have any inside information. So it sounds like, excuse me, now, attainable housing isn't well defined yet, or? Well, attainable, attainable housing kind of is well defined in terms of for sale housing. It is 80% uh, of the area median income on the bottom and either 100 or 110 percent of the area median income on the at the top end but uh, does everybody know what area median income is okay you know what it means i don't know what the number is <laughs> well the number the number changes yeah, all the time and it depends on the size of your family and it, you know so there's never a number um but um but uh Anyway, as long as you know that it's roughly, you know, the median is how much people make here, and uh, it's supposed to be a, ma a measure of, of livability. You know, do you earn enough to actually buy a house here? Uh, and the answer is if you're below 80, no. 
And like now the market's so out of balance that the answer is no, unless you're above 100, um, at least. So uh, um, again, this is not something that HUD forces a definition on us. So as it is for affordability, right? Um, so we will come up with our own definition of attainability in terms of what needs to be incentivized. Um, other agencies not in the federal stack, um, like uh, economic development partnerships, you know, which we have the Longmont Economic Development P Partnership, and then it is a member of associations of similar organizations. So they uh, have data that they'll be presenting to us, and uh, we'll be trying to come up with a good definition that uh, allows housing to be um, built for what can be afforded, you know, what people can afford. Because right now, as you probably already know, Ken, um, the city's having a really hard time recruiting employees. Um, yeah, I'm trying to formulate it. Um, I just don't know a whole lot about the topic, right? So, um, but I do know, for example, like, I mean, for Longmont to have an affordable housing program, mm -hmm. that would, uh, the, the incentives of that, in, in addition to diversity, et cetera, um, it would, uh, kind of relate to accessing perhaps like HUD programs and pools of money that perhaps yes. wouldn't otherwise be available. Is that same type of thing? Because HUD doesn't have a definition for attainable housing, is there like a kind of like loan incentives and other types of kind of like community program incentives or something that are available by having an attainable housing program and striving for that, or is it mostly just like Longmont's interest in doing? Well, it's this? only the ones we make ourselves. Yeah. So the, um, for example, the Economic Development Partnership has enlisted um, a, a loan agency, whose name is escaping me, but it's the one that is co-housed with the EDP, um, and. Uh, the way it works is that employers, primary employers who can afford to do this, will um, agree with the loan agency to kind of provide some security for these loans, and then their employees get first pick and better deal uh, in interest rates and waived fees and all like that that makes it easier for them to um, get housings. And that's all great, except that you have to have something to buy. And right now there's not enough stock, you know, because um, the housing stock that's on the market at Longmont right now is like everything's above 500,000 and everything, everything that you'd actually want is above 700,000. And, uh, you know, so we gotta build other types of housing because the, the cost of land is so high. That's, that's really helpful, actually. So and that's where kind of the innovation part perhaps is coming in. Yes. Thinking about like, okay, what could we do internally, regardless of whether or not there's these external programs that perhaps like there are for affordable housing. Right. Yeah. So you don't get to do to use things like low income tax credits um, for this. Yeah. Um, but so just this is a teeny weeny example, but um, Longmont really recently passed an ordinance that says um, if you've got a single family home on a lot now and you would like to make that single family home into a duplex, you can let it be a duplex and you know you have to meet other requirements like it has two kitchens, right, stuff like that. But you don't have to double the number of water meters and electric meters and stuff so you can have the landlord um, split up the consumption however they decide to do it um, and so you, you uh, get rid of the expense of having all those new connect fees um, for, for the duplex and that is considerable um, you know depending on the house and the size and everything's like twenty five to fifty thousand dollars in fees so it's a, it's a that's a big incentive even though it seems little 
how you heard me describe it. Um, and so things like that, we hope we can come up with a lot more to encourage density, which will then lower the cost of the housing. All right, uh, and again, I appreciate Ken and Mark and your work on getting this cash and him thing moving forward, so I appreciate it. Yeah. All right, how about the Windy Gap permitting projects? Okay, um, just real quick update on the Windy Gap permitting project. It's uh, luckily going very well. <laughs> so, um, Couple couple pictures here I wanted to show. The first one is um, one of the to get to the site. Um, they needed a need a road, and now now the main access for the construction is a different road. But this shows where there's a bridge that's being built over the pen stock, um, the CVP pen stock. That bridge will actually be the after the reservoir is built. We've got a 300 foot tall dam up on the side of the hill. There's a bridge that comes out, a road that will come around serve not only the reservoir, it, it get, it's a road to the back side of the reservoir, there is a, a, a containment dike on the back side of the reservoir that needs to be maintained, but it will also serve as the access for Larimer County open space property, which is immediately adjacent and will have a, a tie-in with, uh, with the project itself. Um, one, of the, one of the things that is constructed and done. This is a coffer dam. It's actually a 50 foot tall dam. So it's one of the highest dams around <laughs> here. Um, you know, Button Rock's taller, but most of the reservoirs around here are, are much less than 50 foot. That's just the coffer dam. That's just to protect the main dam during the construction of the reservoir. And, but as you can see, that's a, that's a pretty um, substantial uh, facility. And it's done. It's done. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's uh, that's a big, big deal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's getting, getting, you know, used to the pace of municipal action. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> federal, no, federal, federal. A, go a, yeah. government, a government project. A government project. Yeah. yeah, I get it. So, uh, so yeah, that's I, I, that is that is good news. So this is a better view. This is today, um, and. You can see up here is that bridge coming over the penstock and the road up around the reservoir. Um, this is the main footprint of the dam. If you can imagine it doing this, um, this is the center line of the dam. This, it, they, they completely excavated down to the bottom of the dam site, which is the most critical point in any dam construction. You, you know, you, you open, you know, that's a, you know, 30, 40 places, almost 50 foot cut from historic, you know. You, you got down, you opened it up, and you didn't, we didn't find any big major surprises. You know, there's always small things you find, but, but we didn't find a, a, a fault line that wasn't known. We didn't, you know, we didn't find a weak uh, section in there. So the, we've kind of taken one step past the, the scariest, most dangerous part any dam construction and they're actually now starting to I'll say come up this is called a plinth it's a, a basically a concrete foundation that you pour on top of the, the underlying bedrock drill drill down you know rebar down it, it's it's concrete rebar um, pretty substantial um, that will go clear across the bottom and then you build the dam on top of it so that you have a good connection you know this plinth it's just a concrete connection between the, the bedrock, underlying bedrock, and the, and the dam that will go on top. As you remember, this is a hydraulic asphalt dam. So the actual as, asphalt, hydraulic asphalt core, which is, you know, pretty narrow, um, and like six foot at the bottom and eight, four foot at the top, will be right on top of that plinth and go clear to the top of the, to the dam. So that is under construction, and you can see that going. And then the coffer dam was over here, um, up, just upstream of it. And the uh, uh, quarry is already completely clean, cleaned off. And they're actually start they're they're blasting and producing uh, rock for um, the construction of the dam because that rock placement's the big deal for this. I mean, seven days a week, two and a half years of blowing up rock and placing it in the dam. 
So uh, that is that is the uh, construction that for um, where we are and uh, doing really good. I mean, we're, we're real happy with that. Um, one, I just I find a little interesting. The, you can see the road over here from the from the bridge, and then the road that'll go around right up in this area. There's a the Larimer County will have a recreation area and a parking lot and you know a boat ramp and all that for for future recreational access. That's being constructed as part of this project, paid for by Larimer County because it's a, a parking lot for their um, use, but it's being built right now because the project will then be able to use that parking lot um, to stage construction out of it, especially as the dam gets higher and you, and you bury all this stuff down there. <laughs> Um, but it'll it'll actually serve a dual use. So um, projects going very well. Um, there's nothing, you know. They're probably nine. If you look at how much money you want to spend, which is a lot, a million dollars a month type stuff, um, a little more than that. Um, uh, you we're about like 96, 87 percent of where we would like to be at this point. Where you project the got slowed down a little bit by that snow. In uh, Christmas snows and, and a few other snowstorms, but not much. So it's going quite well. Um, the other part of kind of the whole project is the connectivity channel on the west slope, which is to bring the Colorado River around the Windy Gap Reservoir over by Lake Granby. Um, that is still moving forward. They're actually doing some preliminary work. There's been a lot of clearing and grubbing and, and whatnot for that. Um, the still don't have a permit yet. <laughs> uh, we're crossing our fingers. The the, uh, the public input process ended, I think, March 10th or something like that. So hopefully, I mean, we're expecting all good comments. I don't know who would say don't build a connectivity channel, but <laughs> you never know. Um, but that comment period is, and so now that that should be um, completed. We hope that permitting process gets completed pretty quickly. Um, and uh, everybody's still on board. That, that seems to be going quite well. And then the final thing I wanted to bring up, um, Northern Water, because this is a construction site, you can't go in and <laughs> poke around. The Northern, uh, the municipal subdistrict project um, is holding tours, um, limited tours. For, for board members. So I would open it up to see if the board is interested in setting up a tour. Um, we're getting a little bit better weather here and I think a, a tour in April or May um, or June or July, whatever, <laughs> but we're, if you're interested, if the board is interested, we'd be happy to set up a tour um, to get up there you know, we're not going to go out actually in the middle of the site, but um, they, they can get us up to where you can see everything. And, and uh, one side is right, this picture, of course, is taken from the east side of the reservoir, basically right up above Carter Lake, looking down in the valley. There's a place there. Um, you can go up to look from this side, and then they also take you up. Can take you into the, on the right side of the picture, you can see the sheds and there's a four big construction uh, location there and then up by the bridge but um and i don't know i i don't know if we'll be able to at some point we'll be able to start writing that that road too so but um, i see a lot of nodding heads so okay I think, I think there's some interest in doing that so okay i'll be happy to set that up um go ahead <laughs> i would also be interested in seeing Absolutely. Um, got to wait till we do something over there, but, but um, Whatever that comes to that's a uh, um, thank you for mentioning that because we will. Um, that's a, a really good idea because we can look at a lot of stuff there. And I don't know if you've ever been in the pumping plant over there. Um, we we can. Uh, um, Maybe not yet. Uh, they're, they're talking about. They haven't announced it, <laughs> but um, yeah, that's we can we can certainly look that up too. So 
Do you, the, does the board have a feeling? I mean, would you like to do something sooner, like April, or wait a little later in May when it's better weather? Wait till June when it's nice and hot. <laughs> um, I, I, we can try to set something up, whatever, whatever works best in everybody's schedules. Any thoughts? You have any? Yeah, my only thought, April might be a little iffy weather-wise. I don't know. You, yeah, you can set the date up, and then it can snow two, twelve inches that day. So I get it past April. But, okay, well, let me talk to Northern about doing something maybe in May. It's beautiful up there in May. Yeah. And, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll get something set up. And what would you prefer, like an afternoon tour this time of the day? Would you prefer an evening, get closer to the evening? I don't know if they'll do something on the weekend, but I can ask that too. I don't know if there's any preference. I think after hearing Ken, I think we'd have a meeting here that makes the most sense. I just look at, as you get towards the end of the school year, it gets pretty busy to try to fit something else in. It does. So, um, would, a, would, a, would a lunch a lunch tour that on the day of Waterboard that then we come back to Waterboard? That's what my, that makes it the 18th of no, that's 18th of April. I don't know that that was maybe it is. I could I could look at maybe a waterboard. So you you only have to <laughs> kind of compress one afternoon in. I think June the 16th. But is that the main? That's the main one. Um, mm -hmm. We might go June also. What'd you say? Yeah, so we could wait till June also. Sure. Right? And uh, later, you know, if you wait till June, you'll you'll see the dam starting to go up. <laughs> that we should be well. I don't know. That plant is going to take a while to get put it up. But, but hey, that's what I have. You know the June waterboard. Um, Juneteenth? Yeah. Yeah, the 20th. So then it would be the 27th. Can we do it? Oh, yes. The 20th is, I'm glad you, mm -hmm. I'm glad you know what you're at. <laughs> you're the New City I holiday. The Juneteenth. Like the Juneteenth. The Monday after June 19th is the city holiday. Yeah. yeah. So we yeah. schedule a board meeting on the 27th. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Want to shoot for that day? Well, let me let me check into that. And we'll see where that goes. Okay, cool. Thank cool. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um. Okay, Jason, you're up. Um. To add to the windy gap, like we, I don't know if you guys are into Facebook or not, but they've got a Facebook page called uh, uh, Chimney Hollow, and I don't know how often they're adding pictures, but they're taking some really gorgeous pictures. I don't know if they paid a photographer or somebody just really knows how to use an iPhone, but anyway, I, I've been following that. I think if you just like it, then, it, then you'll start to get pictures in your news feed on Facebook. So I'd, I'd encourage you to check it out because they've got some pretty cool pictures that um, you don't get to see from uh, the public's perspective. All right, so um, typically I give you guys a, a verbal update, which um, you get, you've been very patient with me. Um, <laughs> uh, so I thought I'd give you some illustrations so you could actually uh, maybe understand what it is I'm saying here. Can you turn that handy as well? So the first one is the uh, South St. Brain Pipeline Pump Station. And so here, this is just basically a site plan. So the top blue line um, is the North St. Brain uh, Pipeline and the blue line on the bottom is the South St. Brain Pipeline. And you can see the South St. Brain Pipeline goes into a wet well, that's the, 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 the box structure there, that then um, funnels water into the pump station, which then gets pushed into the North St. Brain Pipeline. And so this here, um, uh, we've, we've currently um, issued notice to proceed. Uh, Glacier Construction is out there right now. They've actually cleared um, this lot, they're doing an outstanding job. We've removed trees, we've been working with neighbors. Um, so, so far, everything's going great. We're on schedule. Um, that's probably about to change. We're starting to get uh, um, 
delays and stuff coming from materials for supply chain issues and stuff. So back when we issued the, we advertised the uh, RFP, you know, contractors went out, they got bids, they got quotes from, from vendors and everything and then it was subject to change. Well, that change is now happening. And so things that were available in December are no longer available now. Um, so we're starting to see some long lead times, but we're getting pretty creative looking for solutions and stuff. I think at the end of the day, I think realistically, we're we'll probably, this project will probably get pushed back two months. So we're looking at maybe instead of a, a July time frame, maybe we're looking at uh, August or September when this comes online. The great thing about this project is, is we're not up against a hard date to get it done. Um, it really is kind of at our leisure. So um, now having said that, we do want to get Railroad Avenue back into service for the town of Lyons. We do want to get this up and running as soon as possible. But we've, we've got a little bit of float in our schedule. Um, there is FEMA dollars tied to this, but that's not until the end of the year. So the fact that we have so much float in our schedule, we've got six months worth. Um, if we have to delay the project uh, a month or two just so that we can get this uh, correct parts, um, that's fine. So um, that's kind of all I have for the South St. Rain pipeline. So the next sheet um, is one I don't think I've mentioned to the board before because this is a, a new one for us. It's a small project, um, a, a relatively quick project as well. So this one is one that I inherited from uh, Larry Wayno. Uh, he was the engineering administrator uh, over at Engineering Services who retired. And so as part of our um, 2013 flood recovery, we removed the North St. Vrain pipeline from the creek. It crossed this section of the creek like five times. And so now we've put it, we've, the road, uh, this section of the North St. Vrain pipeline is actually in Apple Valley Road. But in order to close out our 1041 permit with Boulder County from that project, um, we had agreed to remove two sections of pipe. And you can see where I annotated remove section of pipe. And I've, uh, I've called that out. And so the orange line is our North St. Rain pipeline. And the um, green line is a, a, the Lions, the town of Lions water line. And so as a courtesy to them, uh, we're gonna go ahead and remove their water line as well. They're paying for it you know, financially, but we're taking the lead on it, getting the floodplain development permits. We're getting, um, you know, the uh, stormwater construction activity permits from Boulder County, which we which we have. Um, before uh, we uh, started construction, we did do a, a site inspection with Boulder County. They gave us great reviews. Everything's going great. So right now, um, we're over here on 558 Apple Valley Road. That's over on the left. Um, we've already removed both sections of pipe from the creek. We've capped them off. Um, we're now mobilizing uh, over to the 416 Apple Valley Road site that's over on the right. Um, the, the Lions water line is actually pressurized up to a valve right up to the area where we're going to cut it. So we're actually going to take that line out of service for one day so that we can cut into the pipeline. It's 250 PSI for water main. So that's, it's yeah, <laughs> we, we don't want to do anything with that kind of pressure on the other side of a valve. So we're gonna take that out of service uh, for one day. We'll cut into it. Um, we'll physically disconnect it. We'll, we'll pour a kicker, which is just a fancy word for a big pile of concrete. So that way when we turn, <laughs> when we turn the uh, water back on and that water pressure hits that valve, it won't try to push the pipe away and become disjointed. And so we're gonna put some, some reinforcements in there to make sure that that doesn't happen. And so anyway, um, it, it's, it's, it's a relatively small minor project, but uh, you know, we are against the clock on this. We need to have this done you know, by the beginning of, of April, and we're on schedule to do that as well. And so anyway, this one's going good, working with, uh, you know, in partnership with uh, Boulder County, um, with the, the residents here. And uh, yeah, so everything, everything's been going good on that one. And this one here, I, I know I've never talked dollars on this one. This one, I'm, I'm estimating is gonna be about $200,000 to remove these two uh, sections of pipe. So then the last handout I have is for the upper North St. Brain pipeline uh, uh, alignment study. So we've talked about this before, how you, you know the upper sections of, of the North St. Brain pipeline are very hard to get to. Some of it's on a cliff, some of that pipe is suspended. Um, and so we're looking at, all right, you know, it's coming to the end of its service life. Um, it could be taken out in the next, you know, next flood event, uh, or or a, or a rock could fall on it. You know, what what do we want to do uh, in the long term? And so we've identified several different ways that we can divert um, some of our water to Nelson Flanders 
that doesn't involve using the upper North St. Drain pipeline. So the upper section that I'm referring to is the yellow dashed area. So this is the one that has two tunnels. This is the one that has timber cribbing, rock cribbing. This is the one that um, uh, I would like to invite you guys to go on a hike and, and explore this and see it for yourself. You kind of have a greater appreciation once you've actually kind of gone up there and hiked it. And it's a, it's a relatively easy hike. It's, it's two hours, but it's maybe it's something that we can do here in the spring. Um, and so anyway, um, looking at, you know, long-term plans for this, you know, one, one of the ideas is, uh, well, we can replace it in kind, which, you know, has some advantages to it, um, but would be very challenging because we don't really have a means of getting, you know, uh, an ATV back there, let alone an excavator or a crane or, or anything like that. So that would, you know, those are some considerations. So the thought was, well, let's leave our divert our point of diversion at Longmont Reservoir in place, but let's just realign the pipe. And so one of the thoughts is the red line here, you can see, let's just put it along Longmont Dam Road. Um, and so we, Longmont Dam Road, um, this would require a, a tunnel section. It would also require a siphon to come back up to the hill. But the great thing about this is um, you have easy access to it. Um, and it gets 100% of our diverted water to the uh, hydro plant. Um, so we'll actually, where you see the yellow and the red line come together, that's the top of the pin stock. So we'll actually be able to keep the hydro plant um, in service. So <coughs> moving to the right, you can see the green line over here. The green line is uh, the existing lines diversion structure. And so the town of Lyons used to you know, provide their own drinking water until the flood of 2013. Well, their diversion structure is still in the creek, and we could potentially use that. Um, so one of the ideas is, well, we could retrofit it to accept 28 CFS, um, which is our carrying capacity. Um, right now, it's designed uh, for, I believe it's 6 CFS, so it's not very much. Um, and so anyway, we'd have to mo highly modify that, and then what we'd also have to do is we'd have to pipe it down Apple Valley Road to our North Pond. Um, so benefit of that um, it's much shorter much easier access downside of that we completely bypass the hydro plant altogether um, and so then uh, another option is looking at just doing a, adding a pump station um, we could potentially add a pump station right there below the north pond we could potentially pump water from the creek into the north pond and from the north pond to our north north st drain pipeline we could also just tie it directly into our north st drain pipeline have another interconnect or it could be both um, again, some benefits to that. Um, uh, one of the downside, a uh, couple downside is, you know, you're putting the infrastructure within the floodplain, so that's not very good. Uh, you're reliant on power, so now as opposed to generating power, you're consuming power, um, so that's not very good. Um, and then, uh, again, you're, you know, you're, you're bypassing you know, the, the hydro plant. And so, then we're looking at, well, maybe we could do combinations of all of these, you know, maybe Maybe one of the long, you know, long term, the end game is to realign or replace the upper north line um, in its entirety where it's at. But at the same time, why can't we go ahead and invest in the lion's diversion structure so, so that if a boulder should fall in the upper north pipeline, we're not completely taken out of the game. Like, hey, we can still divert some of our capacity to Nelson Flanders. It's not optimum for long term, but um, at the same time, it does add redundancy uh, to our infrastructure. Uh, it is susceptible to um, hazard, um, uh, hazard uh, uh, contamination events through, you know, um, uh, vehicles, you know, crashing into the creek off of Highway 36, which happens about once or twice a year. Um, so, but anyway, you know, th these are things that we're that we're looking at, and so I just um, want to let you know that we're still working on this study. Um, we've done the SES, which is the Sustainability Evaluation System, uh, which is a process of looking at this not just from uh, an engineering standpoint, um, but also from an environmental standpoint. So we've completed that. Uh, Dewberry uh, is our consultant who's going to take all this plus a dozen, two dozen other um, uh, design criteria. We're going to put this into a report and then we'll start doing um, a workshop and so one of the workshops we like to do is with the board and kind of present our findings and you know the workshop is a chance to present findings um, gives and, and provide uh, you with an opportunity to give us feedback and with what your thoughts are before we conclude that report um, so anyway that's that's where we're at right now so. a lot of decision making 
Yeah, um, I mean, and you know, the cost to do this, you know, we, we, we thought we had a pretty good handle on what the cost of some of these projects are, but now we're, with what's going on, it's, So what, as far as uh, timing on, is this something you want to have done by any particular date or what, what are your thoughts? So for the study, we'd like to get this done um, before um, our next CIP budget cycle, um, just so that we want to start planning for the long term. At the same time, if it goes beyond that, this isn't something that we're not, it's not like we're going to start budgeting $30 million to start construction in five years on, on, any, on any of this. So it, um, you know, we could potentially do a, a, an easier project like the line subversion structure. Maybe that's something we do in the next 10 years. Maybe we make, if we decide to replace the upper north pipeline in its exact location, maybe over the next 10 years we're looking at doing site improvements and stuff like that, access improvements, so that when it comes time to replace the pipeline, we can actually physically do it. Um, uh, or, you know, if we decide to realign the pipe along one Lot Dam Road, um, you know, there's going to be heavy permitting involved in that. It's going to take several, several years. So, um, I, I, we, I guess looking at this, you know, we're this is we're playing the long game on this one. This is nothing that I don't think anything's really going to materialize in the next five years, other than the study and plan, planning efforts and permitting efforts, stuff like that. Questions for Jason? Yeah. Um, I see there's an industry flow. Um, Sort of Brantford here, and I was wondering if there have ever been any studies there as far as deficits to the stream flow, um, insofar as using the natural stream into the pipeline. I know that it kind of strained the last ones, but you know, what do you think? I'll let Ken answer that one. That might be out of my wheelhouse there. Yeah, um, actually, there's a whole bunch of history on in stream flows in the Hudson Creek. There is an in stream flow. Um, 87, 88 vintage. Um, it unfortunately doesn't do a lot below Mount Mount Reservoir because of the fact that our, basically all winter long, our decree of 28.5 CFS for the whole pipe sweeps the river the entire time that river. Um, we have, I spent probably 20 years doing a in stream flow program on the North St. Grand, uh, North St. Grand that pretty well got blown up by the state and, and, uh, and the flow didn't help it. Um, we do want to reestablish that some time in the future. I don't know how that can happen, um, but um, we have, yeah, we had quite a, quite a very effective program in conjunction with St. Grand like a lot of utilities you did in the state. Um, a lot most of the irrigation ditches along the same rain was uh, so yeah the the uh, that's that is certainly an advantage we were able to in addition to keeping the hydro pipe because it's, it's one of those things you know what, what's what is better for the environment having a hydro plant you know good clean green energy or having an in-stream flow I mean you know those are the two Competing interests, uh, I get it, um, and, and that is still something. So we're all going to have to wrestle with this stuff as well. But um, we were able to do both uh, for quite a while, and it was a pretty effective program. And uh, you know, we're, we're hoping someday to be able to do that. Um, it's it's going to be a big lift, and it takes a long time. <laughs> But that is, you know, one of the things the sustainability evaluation system looked at was there's definitely an advantage. Again, you have to look at you know, what's, you know, unfortunately the environment isn't a single thing. You know, you can run water down the stream more, but then it's lower quality by the time you fill it up. And that's one of the things we looked at really, really hard how long that is that. We enjoy some of the highest quality water source um, because we prefer down at Long Mount Reservoir. Rather than once, once you go below Long Mount Reservoir, there's a considerable amount of 
stream side septic systems, and then there's a considerable amount of impact from roads and, and quite frankly, car accidents. You probably remember a couple of years ago we had a tanker truck crash in Napa Valley and pumped 5,000 gallons of fuel. <laughs> you know, you don't want to be running that into your water treatment plant. We, are, we do currently have the ability, and we do occasionally run water down to the Highland Ditch. We haven't any carriage again with the Highland Ditch to divert in the Highland, you know, from carry down to there, divert in the Highland Ditch, put in the water treatment plant. And that is um, actually, we didn't have that when we did the prior um, in stream flow program because that plant wasn't built yet. But now we have that ability um, and could, could do that. So there are a lot of options to do that river education. Um, and I hope after spending as long as I did, <laughs> my career getting that other program going, I hope to get it going in something I'd love to see something else going in, in the future. It would be, it would be great. I mean, that's part of what that SCS that I believe is you know, impacts the water quality, but also the benefits of the water quality. A lot of, a lot of give and take on, on that part of the plan. So, the, I mean, what you're showing here are kind of three different alternatives. Are, are there other alternatives in the, in the mix, such as keeping water in the river, or, or are these three alternatives the ones that are really kind of the... So yeah, so this one's more focused just on the upper north pipeline and the alternatives for that, not alternatives for water delivery as a, as a whole for the city. So it's really focusing on this yellow dashed line we know is going to become a huge problem for the city, and it's gonna cost millions of dollars to fix it, or tens of millions of dollars to fix it. You know, we need to start long-term planning for it now. So that's kind of what this study is gonna focus on. And, and on, on Jason's picture there, you see the little orange pump station. That's okay. illustrative of what you could do there with that pump station. We actually looked at a number of different yeah. locations. One of them is at the um, Honglichen Rough and Ready Headgate, just east of Lyons. You could run it down to there. We have most of our change cases have that as an alternative point, alternative point of diversion. It really helps us because you got to be careful not to take too much in the water course. <laughs> you get slammed every time you take something in the water course. Um, so even though that orange line is at that location, we certainly, um, as these things move forward, you can look at something like that and say, well, the, the benefit of moving that. One, one benefit we have of the Highland Ditch and the Hollington Rough and Ready is we're below the confluence of the South. And so now we have both all of our decrees on the south and all of our decrees on the north available at that at those two locations. So mm -hmm. there's so much to look at that <laughs> Jason's really busy looking at all those so, things. So I guess inherent in that orange line then is essentially keeping water in the river, delivering it to that point of diversion or something like that. Correct. Yeah. And and yeah, exactly as as, as Kim mentioned that that pump station, the idea of that is I mean we've actually yeah, we've identified like five other locations. But just for simplicity of putting it all on one page, we just showed, we just showed that. But that was that's what the study's looking at is okay, the pump, the pump station, that's 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 an idea. Where would it be best suited? And so now we're going out and doing individual studies as well. And so um, you know, kind of like the lines diversion structure, do we want it to carry the full capacity? Do we want it to carry just what it can already take? Um, a combination. So it's these are the big ideas, but each one, each 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 idea, we're diving into the details, and then the combination of each idea, and the different options we have that way. And I guess the way that we we like the hybrid options because it, it gives us the most flexibility in how we use our portfolio. Yeah, and I I totally understand this this kind of what uh, competition or something between water for hydropower uses and water for downstream stream uses, as was mentioned. I think I remember from our tour up there though, it was that, and don't get me wrong, the hydropower plant is amazing and it's got this wonderful historic kind of aspect to it that is very special, I think, for the Longmont area. Um, in terms of the amount of power it generates, it's relatively simple to do. I mean, what was it, 0.1% or something like that? 
if you look at our total energy supply, it's very small in terms. We actually have a requirement of 10% uh, generate renewable energy generated locally. Yeah. And if we're looking at that, that actually is, I think, 2% of that 10%. So it does, and even though overall, if you look, you're right, it's like 0.2% of our overall supply, but it does actually help us meet um, that uh, local generation. So it's this really specific yeah. kind of niche, I guess, within, yeah, okay, I get it. Yeah. It's not entirely hot. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and we also, in the yeah. SES evaluation work, just in terms of the hydro plant, not just thinking about the renewable energy, but also the cultural and historic significance of the plant. So um, a couple different factors that we looked at. The other thing to consider is if we were to take the hydro plant offline, that doesn't mean the hydro plant would go away. It's, it's a historic structure. It would still be there. So it would, it would almost be a shame for it to be sitting there and not to be used. So it's not like, hey, we're, we're, we'll, we'll return it back to Mother Earth and we'll tear it down. And, uh, and, and now you know, wildlife can then flourish. I mean, it would, it would still be there. So and we would still have to maintain it. So it just so we're just uh, figuring out after the flood, do some upgrading in that hydro plant based on what damage occurred there? Or? Um, there wasn't too much damage. There really wasn't any damage to the hydrocar plant because the, the north pipeline was fairly quickly basically plugged off along the resort, so we didn't get any debris or anything down through the hydrocar plant. But at about that time, ironically about a little before that, they had completely automated the plant. So uh, you know, our last plant operator retired, and, and they, it's now operating automatically. So. Anything else, Jason? No, excuse me. Go ahead, Al. I love the idea of a workshop because this sounds like it would be really interesting and have a lot of different aspects that could be considered and made. And if this is a really big lift, it seems like a lot. And, and the feed, actually, so Dewberry, when they participated in the SES, so they, they were one of the participants. They were, they actually sent us an email afterwards saying like, it's so great that we had the SES tool and that we used it. He's like, you know, we work with a lot of municipalities on pro projects like this and a lot of times it's just a, a one person show without taking into any consideration of, of sustainability, planning, uh, any, anything like that. And so. Um, so kudos to Longmont for being a forward thinker and pioneers in that because they were, I mean, they said that like we, we have never seen a municipality really care and have workshops like that and get so many different participants in there. Anything else, Jason? I just for one second then, I mean, with that in mind, can you tell us just a tiny bit more about the SES? How about Francie? Because <laughs> I think this is her baby now. Sure. So. Yeah. Uh, so I, I want to start with, I, I'm referring to the internal sustainability evaluation system. There is an external one that's slightly different that's used for certain development projects. So our internal sustainability evaluation system, um, it's essentially a tool um, for applying uh, the triple bottom line or sustainability lens, whichever way you want to refer to it, uh, to uh, large scale projects. So we have I would say uh, two different modules. The first one, like really early on, maybe if you're developing a citywide plan and wanting to think through, okay, do we need a factor in uh, transportation staff and um, water staff and kind of just factoring in. We did the module two, two that really looks at different options um, and factors in. Um, there are, I have actually pulled it up. There's, uh, um, 11 different topic areas from best practices to economic vitality to natural environment to energy, transportation, water. And you and within each of those larger categories, it's, it's really broken down into um, sub, subtopics. So water could have uh, water conservation as well as water supply. And we actually added a couple um, for water rights uh, and, and uh, uh, there was one other that um, also in the kind of the realm of water rights, natural environment, 
Um, that's where we have things around watershed, and can, but also natural environment can be broader um, outside of that. And then we pull together staff from across the organization. Um, so, uh, so it's not just Jason thinking through this, but we had uh, um, staff from um, who run our hydro plant who are part of it. We had staff um, from our water treatment plant. We had staff from who are bringing different perspectives to it. And, and essentially we go through and rate the tool together. And you go through and you essentially assign a rating based on an established scale. And, uh, and then you kind of do it together. So instead of everyone doing it individually, we, we recommend you kind of do it individually to get an idea and then you come together, but it's a really a conversation. It probably took us five hours. Uh, yeah, and well, two, over two days. We had, we had to over do it two days. Yeah. Um, so it's this, and I, I was just, I, I um, asking um, Jason that we could, there is a final report we put together um, that I believe we can send out to the board if you all want to review it. Um, with the context that this is just part of Jason's analysis, um, but uh, if you're interested in kind of looking at like the three social ways from the SES, I would be, um, be happy to share that out. Yeah, that'd, be, that'd be great. That takes me back to my consulting days back, back when I was fresh out of college, I guess these are the types of things that I used to do. Yeah, cool. Yeah, likewise, I'd be interested. Yeah. Okay, Jason, anything? <coughs> um, that's it for major projects. Uh, just a quick reminder that the South St. Vrain Pipeline Rehab Project's done, so I'll stop giving you updates on that one. And as soon as the pump station is online, um, the South St. Green Pipeline will then be servicing Nelson Flanders with the, you know, through the pump station at Highland Bridge. So, yeah. I'm very happy with that. <laughs> it's been a long time. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, no problem. All right, Francie, or not, yeah, you've got a water conservation update. I do. Um, so a shorter update um, this month, I believe in May, I'll be doing the, the larger update where I bring, I'll have our total uh, water consumption numbers from 2021 so I can show you all the trends um, that I uh, usually do about uh, once a year um, but just wanted to let you all know that our a lot of our starting gate in the summer outdoor water conservation programs um, Garden in a Box launched our so we have two different types of discounts we have a $25 discount which sold out in less than a week um, and then we have our um, our CARES so we have the Longmont, oh, I do not know what that acronym is. It's a really great program. Mm -hmm. um, I do not know what that acronym stands for. Um, but we provide a $100 discount through that. So that uh, we are not having as, last year we actually sold that one pretty quickly as well. We're not having as great of an uptick this year. Um, but I think there was also a drop in CARES participation one. So it, last year, so it could have been a number of different factors uh, but we're still promoting that one and hoping we can have greater uh, participation in the $100 discount. And then uh, this year, uh, Resource Central opened up their church replacement program to more communities. Uh, Longmont's not currently participating this spring. We are in conversations to join in the fall, and there will be official announcement about that in May, in early May. So when I, come, when I have the larger announcement about that in May, we can talk a little bit more uh, about Longmont's participation uh, in that program. And thank you, because there's been a tremendous amount of interest in that program. So everybody wants to get rid of their turf. Yeah, yeah, we, we uh, in general, uh, Resource Central, they told me the demand is just way higher across all every single community they serve. Um, so I think they're already thinking about hiring more staff. So. Uh, yeah, it's not just here in Longmont, but all across the front range, there's huge demand for that program. Anything else? That's it. Okay, 10 monthly legislative report. Yeah, not too much to report. We don't have any bills that were actually um, recommended as quarter proposed or anything like that. Um, there is one bill, though, that I thought I would highlight just because you actually may get questioned about it. <laughs> We've actually got a couple questions about it. 
Um, it's Senate Bill uh, 22-029. It's an anti-speculation bill. Um, we've talked about anti-speculation in Colorado for a very, very long time. Um, and there's been different ideas thrown about. There's more concern, I think more so on the West Slope, some big, big um, things going on over there. Uh, some, some water being brought up a little bit uh, in, the, in the, um, Arkansas, but just a general kind of concern about speculation on water and the general thought that, yeah, that shouldn't happen. That people should be utilizing water, but shouldn't be buying it up, trying to speculate on it. Um, but that being said, so this bill basically sets up an anti-speculation law um, that said, um, that is not real, real clearly defined in that um, it, it, what it would do is if somebody's purchasing water for purposes of speculation on it, make money that the state engineer's office can, can intervene. Um, it has a kind of a funny requirement for ditch companies that ditch companies have to declare a minimum amount of shares per user that the state would use as a criteria to determine if somebody's speculating. And I have no idea how ditch companies are gonna figure that one out. Ditch companies on it. Uh, exactly. They don't have any idea about it. Um, so it's been introduced. I, it hasn't even come out of committee. I'm not sure it'll make it this year, but I, I don't know. Um, it do, it's not going to impact Longmont because Longmont doesn't. One reason we have a charter restriction that says we can't sell water, so we're never going to get water that we're going to hope to speculate on it and try to sell for. Um, so it really doesn't impact Longmont directly, so that's one reason we don't we don't um, take positions on bills that don't directly impact Longmont. But it has scared the heck out of some of the development community. <laughs> they tend to the development community tends to go out and buy water, um, especially in, for Longmont because you can use it as, as part of your development process. So there there has been some water that's been purchased. Then the developer holds on to it, annexes the parcel property, and then dedicates the water to it. Well, that is not historic. So, I mean, we're, we're familiar with that process. But we've had a number of developers call us and say, uh, Do I got to sell my water? You know, what? is this going to affect me? And I says, Nah, not really. I, I, I think as long as you know you can show your nexus, I, I have this water, I have this land, I'm passing in Longmont. Um, but I, you know, really, truly, honestly, can't cost that. It you know, depends on what some. But he did, you know, wants it, wants it. Well, and, and where, you know, if the bill changes. Right now, I don't, I don't see it affecting any, even any of our developers. Right? But, but who knows? You may be asked by somebody who's saying, "Hey, I'm, I'm concerned about this," or you may be asked by people saying, "Hey, this is a good idea because I don't want speculators from New York coming in and buying up water in our basin." So, um, if it, if it starts moving forward and we hear anything, you know. You know Sure to let the board know, but I just I, I find it a little interesting. It, it's a really good idea. You don't want speculators, but <laughs> I, that's a really hard thing to to really turn into a law. So we'll see where that goes. And don't know where it'll go, but um, tough to tough to run a big water bill. I think is really we'll, we'll watch them real closely to see what happens. Okay, uh, let's go on to item 10, review of major project listings and items kind of for the schedule for future board meetings. Um, just my comment on, on looking at these, uh, basically this is the last meeting that we're talking about several items and then beyond that there's no date schedules so to be determined. Um, I don't know if Ken, if there are some items that we better ought to set some dates on, or what are your thoughts about that? Um, we just, yeah, we don't need dates on, on those unless unless the board would like to have something coming 
that um, uh, the the water system yield is, is just a study you know a study we do about third or fourth year. I'm sure when that becomes ripe to do again, we'll do that again. The stream management plan you know has been done by the district. Um, they did come in um, last fall and give us an update on that. They are actively, the district is looking at um, doing some work in that arena. And um, rather than try to set a date, I, I prefer waiting for the district to give us some input on uh, where we're going. And then again, the attainable housing uh, will, we'll, that's probably sooner than later, but we're trying to fit in well with, with where the uh, committee or the group is looking at that. Um, and we'll, we'll be following. But, yeah. Any comments from the board on the schedule? Uh, I was just going to say, I just want to make sure we don't lose momentum on continuing to think about the cash in hand um, criteria and just making sure that we continue to, to, to um, set up that justification or kind of firm in that justification, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and that is, we do have, that it does come every quarter, so yeah. uh, we will continue to. Yeah, to and so in my view, yeah. you have kind of th three months to think about that again, right? And when it's all said and done, that's only six okay. hours of, of water board time, I suppose. So, so, um, so just making sure that we continue with the momentum. Sure. All right. We'll go on to annual water board report, uh, which is pretty sizable. Um, yeah, it is. And basically, you know, we, it's your report to council. So if there's ever anything you want us to do differently, all we try to do is help you out by, by compiling it for you. Um, but yeah, we, we put it in your packet and if there's any changes or any revisions you want to, we're happy to do that. If not, we just um, have the board uh, kind of accept the report that we compiled and we would then send that on to the city council. I thought it made us look like we did more than I thought we did this year. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, it's a lot. I thought it was a very positive report. It, it, Maybe it, I just it, forgot some of the stuff for the year. Yeah, it's amazing when it's you put it all, yeah, it's all together. Um, a lot of good things. Yeah. So are you are you looking for us to move to send it on to council, or what are your thoughts? Yeah, if if you if you are happy with it as it's currently put compiled, we'll be happy. We'll receive that and you can give us direction we'll pass it on to council or to council is your report any thoughts from board members i thought it was a really well done report and i only move to accept it and send it on to the city council as is Okay. But uh, all in favor? I yeah. Know. I, okay. I, I was only around for half the year, so do I get the half vote? Around enough to a full vote. Huh? Okay. Okay. Uh, this next item, I hope you got a chance to read a little bit about this. But this is something that is new to us. And new to all the commissions, um, the council and Marcia, you can weigh in on this in a minute, but uh, evidently the, the thought was that if you're looking at candidates for board membership, it wouldn't be a bad idea to have board members be involved a little bit in the interview process. And I, I take it this is a pre-council interview process, uh, but I think it. I, I think it's uh, interesting to for us to have a look at the candidates and maybe comment on how we feel uh, the con candidates may uh, be um, appropriate for these boards. And 
I think it's it's interesting that we're, we're moving forward with something like this. Mark, can you, how did this ever come about, by the way? Uh, well, uh, there's a number of things. First of all, since you all went through the council interview process, uh, it's ridiculous, right, that you're going to choose somebody that has as much authority and brings as much insight uh, into this process of keeping tabs uh, on how the city's water policy is being carried out. Um, and you get picked out of a five minute interview from a bunch of people who may, on average know about nothing about why they're picking people, right? So uh, the idea was let's have better qualified per, um, applicants and fewer of them so that we can um, understand things like is this person, you know, do a manager interview, right? Is this a, a responsible person? Does this person have a weird agenda? Um, does this person have, you know, we want to we want to just do those high level management things and not do does this person know anything about water and and is this person qualified to actually weigh in on the subjects that this that the board reviews so the idea is that um, the board either with a nomination committee of two members or with a committee of the whole um, would interview the big group of applicants and pick out a smaller group of applicants, which can be as few as one, right, for one per seat, um, that the council would interview and hope that there would be uh, a more respectful process as well as ending up with the, best, the most qualified board we could have. So that was, that was the idea. Just out of curiosity, when the council interviews with proposed board members. Do you have a set set of questions that you ask, or how? To, I'm not trying to be nosy, but I am trying to be nosy. How does that work? Well, you should be nosy. Um, yes, and actually, that was an, in, an an innovation. The first year I was on council, we didn't. You know, we just showed up and and went round robin, and everybody asked a question, which isn't. And it's not, if, if this were a for pay job, it wouldn't even be legal to interview that way. You know, since it's a volunteer job, it's not regulated, but we should still use best practices, right? So after the first year, uh, we started having a list of questions that we would all ask, and or we would ask every candidate. And then I think the second year, we actually had the board, ask the board to recommend what count questions to ask. But, um, you know, it still made it was a five minute interview. You really couldn't ask, couldn't, you never got through the whole list and, and you couldn't really find anything out about the person. So we were really voting um, on the resumes, right? You guys all have really stellar water resumes, um, but for many boards, that isn't true. You know, it's it's easy to look and say, oh, but yeah, this person is a land use attorney. I guess they do okay, right? Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, get the word guess. You just, you just don't want to ask the board. Pardon me. Yeah. So so what? Uh, just looking forward, if we were to be involved in the first portion of the interview process, would we be given? Questions or would we? How how would, would the questions um, so, evolve? So um, Don Quintana has a list of questions that was the list used last time, and that this is I I haven't read um, what you guys were given, so um, so this is what I believe to be true because um, you guys are in charge of the process. Uh, so she has a list. You guys can look at that list and say, this is a great list, we're going to use it. Or you can look at the list and say, that has nothing to do with it. Let's put this question in instead. So you can you, you can develop your own list, but you should then use it for every applicant the same. The, the, the question, I, did you have a comment? Well, I was just going to say, and yeah, 
the, the process is really set up around the staff liaisons will work with the boards to set up the questions, set up the interviews. Um, we'll do the lifting and getting the, you know, the venue and getting the candidates there. And, and basically the board will just actually do the interview. So really the two questions today that we kind of need to answer are, um, does the board want to do two, maybe three, or all five board members? And of course, Tom's not here, to, he's, his term is up this year. So if he chooses to run again, um, then he wouldn't have to be on the interview. Um, but if he doesn't, then he could show up here. Yeah. Um, so, so really, the biggest thing I, we need today, I mean, we'll talk about these procedures more and more, but, but it's, you know, how, how, how does the board prefer doing it? You know, just you know, two or you three or all five. And when do you want to do it? Um, because we, we kind of need to know at least that much so we can get things set up. The interviews will be in May. Um, we, just so you know the schedule, I think it's April 22nd is when um, the applications have to come in. And so then whoever on the board will be interviewing will, you know, we could have two or we could have five. We, we really never have a whole lot of, I mean, we don't have tons and tons. We don't have to interview, but however many come in, is, is, we'll set that those interviews up in May. And then we have to interview the interviews in May so that um, we have to give the results to council. Um, I think it's the first Friday in June. So um, we really can't wait till April because the 22nd is actually after the board meeting in April, in just a few days. So it'd be really tight to try to get something going. And that way we can get the questions and we can get the <coughs> procedure set up and work with the board members on your timing and you know, when, well, when you can do it. Yeah, let me just pose the question to you three. Uh, they are proposing you can do one or the other depending on what your desires are. We come up with a committee of two board members or all of us be involved and I'm, I'm curious how you all feel about what what your preference would be. Let's start with you, John. What? <laughs> um, I, I would be comfortable uh, with having a subcommittee. I don't think it's necessary to ask for us to convene the entire board for that purpose. That's my comfort level. That's the desire. We can certainly try that. If I look at my uh, May time frame and I probably have pressed the time to participate, but that would be internal and figure out what the process is. So, would, would we, we be in person or? We can't be on the phone with the board meeting. It could be done virtually. We could do those interviews virtually. It would make it a little easier to report it. Mm -hmm. Real question. So, let me just make sure I understand what you're saying. Is have just a committee of two do it rather than all of us? Be involved. That's my comfort level for the school. I mean, I, I, I'm a co-managing partner of my law firm. All I'm doing right now is interviews. Yeah. That's <laughs> what I do for a living now. Because as you, it's hard to find people that want to work in Longmont, apparently. Go yeah. figure. Okay. Um, so trying to convene a bigger group is, is a nightmare. That, that, that's my view, my practical rationale. Okay. How about you, Tom? What's your thought? Uh, I could go either way. Um, so I'd be, I don't know if you're just watching or not make a decision, but. Um, uh, like like Scott saying, I'm I'm comfortable with you all doing it instead of me. But I, I would love to be involved, so I could also be part of that subcommittee, or we could all do it together. Or whatever. Um, I'd be inclined to a practical approach. See how many people we get, and how many of us we met, and scheduled, and what we can decide what we're more comfortable with more. But like to be the second. I'm inclined, rather than to say, okay, here's the two doing it, uh, my preference would be those that want to be involved, be involved. Uh, we all have different ideas, and uh, I think we'd have a little more robust process uh, doing it that way. So maybe we can just leave it that way that as we get to the situation, 
we can ask who wants to be involved. And I guess, Ken, what we're kind of saying is we don't want to restrict it just to two okay. for, a, for a committee. That's what I'm hearing. So it may be just two, but you're open to having more. Yeah. So you want, right. that you want that flexibility. But it's fewer than five minutes a committee, otherwise, it's all about three. Yeah. And, <laughs> and actually, <laughs> Water board yeah. only five members. Yeah, that's some yeah. boards are ten or twelve members. Right. I wouldn't want to put twelve people around the table. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's really daunting for new to me to have that many people involved as well, in my opinion. That's yeah. one thing that they suggested in there and talking about that. If you do consider having the whole board there, just be cognizant of that fact and not be overwhelming to the candidates mm -hmm. coming in. It's, you know, it's do we get to determine or I mean staff perhaps get to determine the time? Like the timing of, I mean, I know that we, we just talked about the restrictions in terms of like when this window that needs to happen. Well, we would but like have to Thursday work with you all something. to figure out what dates and times would work. So I'm just um, curious as to like, I mean, if it winds up, so this past year there were two applicants for the MRA. So, I mean, there would be, if it was a 10 minute interview, that's 20 minutes of a lot of board meetings. But they're saying it's a 30 minute interview. It's up to 30 minute interview. It's up no to longer 30 than 30, minutes. sorry. Yeah. Thirty minutes seems like a long time, but I don't think it's predetermined. Okay, so if it was That's longer, then of course that would work right. during a lot of board meetings. Well, we'd have to probably look at our schedules and see how the timing of that works out. And, and I like the flexibility of saying if this is the window, who's available and who's not available. So it does seem like each candidate needs to be treated the same. So yeah, we oh, have yeah. a block yes. no, where I, I can interview yes. everybody. Right, right. No, you, we don't want to, yeah, we don't want to have different But well, it's fair to assume we'll have one space available on the board yeah. when Todd's term is up. Mm -hmm. And the question is, of course, how many belts are going to have five people? But why? If it's a not low number, it may be a very small time. Yeah. So Todd is, I mean, he is term limited, is he? Actually, or? so Todd, when he came in for his first term, was a, um, filling a vacancy. So he has only served one full term and he is eligible to serve another term. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. 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 Been on for two terms for about three full terms. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, if he wants to. Yeah. 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 Has he stated his desires one way or the other? Um, he's he's trying to think it through. He's got, he's also, you know, on the board of Northern and he's also got a Son is a senior in high school, you know, he's looking at possibly moving out of town, so he's considering a lot of different options. As a, I'm not sure he's made a decision yet. Did you tell him when we need a decision? <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> you can't wait till August. But. He's got one month. Okay, yeah. you understand that. Yeah, he has to apply by the 22nd. Okay, all right. Well. Um, the other thing, Ken, because you mentioned a lot that the staff is handling a lot of logistics, which was a really good thing to mention. But um, the other thing is, if it is a committee of two, uh, you don't have to notice the meeting. Right. And that would mean that it'd be easier for you guys to schedule if you're having a hard time scheduling. If it's any more than two, then you have to notice the meeting or hold it during the water board meeting, which is already noticed. So I just thought I'd stick that in. No, it's good. I didn't want that. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. <laughs> good, good, good deal. So anyway, uh, I guess we'll see, depending on Todd, you know, we might be involved, we might not be. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, staff will go ahead and start getting the process together, we'll get some questions together, we'll get yeah, process have, together. Have you actually posted for applicants? Yeah, the, I think the process is open. Aren't we for applicants to apply or not yet? Yeah, but I mean, I'm we don't know who we are. Todd says he's staying. Oh, he's ultimately, he's just an applicant. So. He's an applicant. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if yeah. he is, okay. all right. All right. He made it a sole app. All right. That right. right. may, may make it easier. All right. All yeah, right. may make it easier, but okay. Uh, Any other comments on this interview process? I think it, I think it's a good move, Marcia. Yeah. It's always good. Yeah. yeah. Well, it does. It yeah. is a little of a burden on, on council, but 
but it, 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 it was just dumb, you know. <laughs> really enriches the process, I think. Well, I don't know how they did it when they had all of them at the same. They used to all be in the center. You know, but now they're split half. And yeah. Half. I can't imagine. I don't know. It or, was, or remember. <laughs> I did not have to experience that. <laughs> and this this process would happen twice this year. So there's the mid year recruitment that happens in uh, June, and then there's the one that happens at the end of the year too. So. Yeah. But if there's no seats available, then there's not a process. To That's true. Yeah. yeah. A lot of boards are going to figure that out. I think so. Yeah, thought that through. Yeah, half the boards are June and half the boards are December. So, one of those boards All right. Very good. Okay. Item 11, anything on that? Anything yeah. on that? Not right. Okay. And cash in lieu, as Pam said, we bring that up quarterly. Um, any comments on future water war agendas? Anybody or anything? Just if you want, if there's something, an opportunity for the board to ask for one of the items that you might be interested in or information. You know, I had I had one question, Marcia. Are we is the city going through a, 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 a revision of our comp plan or in the process of that or yes. Um, I'm not sure how formal it is going to be. Um, or, I mean, it's going to get formal when it gets adopted, and I assume, don't quote me on this, I assume it's going to get um, reviewed by the boards that have anything to do with land use, which would be include you guys, I would hope. Um, but uh, the idea is that the revisions will uh, have to do with going from a suburban land use model to an urban land use model. Uh, and, uh, you know, anything I said about what that means, other than you can stick more people in the same space, uh, would be an own opinion of mine. Uh, but, uh, and I have them, so I'm going to keep my mouth shut and say that's the essential. Uh, driver of this is is making the comp the, the comp plan more appropriate to an, an urban site than a suburban site. But could have impacts on our water need though. Oh absolutely. You know, yeah, that's so. what I mean. Anything that has anything to do uh, with land land use and in fact I think it was you can that at, at we, I encountered you and said, how are we, how are we doing in terms of, of looking at a, a higher build-out number in terms of heads? Um, because that needs to, you know, at some point that's going to need to be reconsidered and, and probably in light of, as well as in advance of the new comp plan. Um, but yeah, that's, that's definitely going to happen and it, um, well, just like the existing one, you know, it, uh, all the pieces, all, all the pieces have to fit together, right? And, and especially as you increase density, transit becomes a lot more important because the philosophy is, is you want more of the people who work here to actually be able to live here. Um, and that reduces traffic, automobile traffic, at least nationwide the studies show that it does um, nobody believes that here of course but um, you know so all, all, all a lot of different pieces including water consumption because of course you have more showers fewer lawns um, so it's a big deal what's the timing on that I would not venture to guess so here no comment <laughs> That's not the same thing. I would not venture a guess as an absolute comment, right? Well, it's, it's, you know, I, they know they, I, they, they know they have to do it. They, um, uh, I don't think they know how long it's going to take. You know, what everybody I talk to understands the basics of new urbanism. So at least they are somewhat prepared in terms of, of 
what the parameters they are going to be considering are. Um, but how long it's going to take to get agreement and, and you know, get all the gears to mesh, I would not venture a guess. No. Perhaps you can explain. Yeah, I just wanted to add in that, so a new Young Monarch Comp Plan and the Sustainability Plan are going to do a joint update this year, or, or I think this year. The, uh, I know there's been, it was going to be this year, and I think there's just things changing and depending on staffing, so it, it may begin later this year. Um, but the, that, I, I just wanted to highlight that those uh, plans are going to be updated together. Um, the goal, the sustainability plan was passed after the comp plan, but the plan was for them to always be very integrated plans. So trying to figure out a joint update, um, and I know staff have started to add, uh, start those conversations and uh, with the water efficiency master plan update that's uh, to be finished by 2024. We've also talked about how can we do um, some joint engagement and also uh, analysis with that larger update. But again, I also, of course, I don't have a date either. Um, I just wanted to let the board know that it's going, it, looking at kind of two of our big overarching guiding plans together at the same time. I didn't know that, and that's a really good idea. And it, I think that's, it's, a, it's a, a good check and balance that Francie and I both said, well, it's starting, but we have no idea when it's going to end. <laughs> Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, nothing else on the agenda. Any comments? 